It's been quite a week. President Biden delivered an ultimatum to our longtime ally Israel. And here at home, a number of American adults told us they are prepared to accept violence in our political system. To discuss all that and more, we turn now to the analysis of Brooks and Capehart. That's New York Times columnist David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart, associate editor for The Washington Post. Great to see you both, as always. I want to pick up where Jeff's interview with Senator Coons there left off. Jonathan, you just heard Senator saying that he is open to conditioning aid to Israel and under those conditions as he laid them out. This is a close advisor of President Biden saying this, joining the ranks of some other lawmakers who've been saying this for a while, we should say. But after the killing of those seven aid workers, does this feel like a tipping point when it comes to President Biden's relationship with leaders in Israel. Yes, I think I, I think it is. And we, we've seen this coming. I mean, how many weeks have we sat here on a Friday night talking about how while the relationship between the two nations is firm and solid, the relationship between the two leaders of those nations, there's daylight coming in there. And, you know, the president and the administration would say, don't do this, Prime Minister Netanyahu. And Prime Minister Netanyahu basically say, hold my beer. But the killing of those seven aid workers from World Central Kitchen, founded by Chef Jose Andres, who is someone that the president knows. When the president went to Ukraine, he went to a World Central Kitchen um, um, meal station uh, during that trip. Owner of, of restaurants where the president goes to have dinner sometimes. The so known this, quantity to the Right, president. right, right. So this is someone he knows. This is someone. So it struck him, I think, personally in ways that other mistakes maybe have not, but there needed to be a turning point. There needed to have something happen to get the president and the administration to be a little more, a lot more forceful and to get the attention of the prime minister, which I think the president got after that phone call yesterday. David, how do you look at this? Do you, do you see this as a tipping point in the same way? And do you see U.S. lawmakers actually moving to condition aid? Yeah, I don't really think it's a tipping point. I think, that, as Chris Kuhn said, it's been a gradual thing. I've been talking to experts on this who served in Republican administrations and Democratic administrations. And there's a rough consensus, which is that Israel has to finish the job on Hamas. It would be an absolute disaster for the region, for U.S. interests, if Hamas was somehow to emerge as an intact political and military force. It would destabilize the region for forever. Uh, and so that has to happen. At the same time, there seems to be a consensus that Israel has to do a vastly better job at protecting the aid convoys, at letting the aid in, and particularly, as Kuhn said, in if they're going to take, uh, invade Rafah, which they sort of have to do, they have to get the million people out of there, and they have to provide free passage to the north. Uh, and we have to do everything we can to pressure Israel, and I think some sort of uh, conditions on aid are, if Israel's not going to provide the million to leave uh, and into safe zones in the north, then we should do what we can to pressure them to do that, because it would be against Israel's self-interest to do that, and it would certainly be against America's interest. I was cheered by the readout on the Biden-Netanyahu call. I had feared that Netanyahu would want to run for re-election as running against the U.S., say, I'm the guy who can protect you from the pressure from those craven Americans. But he did not in the call, apparently. He, he, he accepted the conditions that President Biden laid before him. He's already complied with a few of them, and he's promised to apply for more. And so it, this pressure may be working, which Biden wants, to pressure Netanyahu without cutting him off or putting on conditions. David, there's the issue of protecting the aid workers, as you mentioned, but does this also call into question just how discerning Israel has been in carrying out its strike so far? Yeah, I think there are two things to be said, uh, contradictory. Uh, the first is, this is a war unlike any other. Sometimes people compare this to our, the, the U.S.-Iraqi assault on Mosul and other cities. But I've never heard of another war where the, the, the enemy is in 500 miles of tunnels underground. And the enemy's chief strategy is to generate as many civilian deaths as they can to, to get world pressure to force Israel to desist. So this is just a much harder deal. Having said that, I've you know, been covering the Middle East for a little while, and one has certainly discerned a growing callousness uh, toward Palestinian lives in the Israeli population. Not, I'm not sure how split Netanyahu is from a lot of the people within Israel itself. They're, they think, why should we risk Israeli soldiers for, uh, for, to protect people who want to kill us? Uh, but it has to be explained to them that this is in your own self-interest. It's just a humanitarian disaster, aside from being a, a moral atrocity is in Israel's self-interest to present, to protect. So I think there's both just the 
horrific conditions that Israel is fighting under, but also uh, overaggressive, as we heard from the expert earlier in the program, and a growing callousness toward Palestinian suffering. Yeah, and and I think the the, the growing callousness, I think, is what's really sort of bo bothering me, and why I think that the the World Central Kitchen um, deaths is a is a turning point. There's a, the thing that's the thing that bugs me is, for years. I have known, we all know, the Israel, Israel Defense Forces are among the most sophisticated armed forces in the world. And yet, time and time again, since October 7th, we have seen these very sophisticated armed forces make mistake after mistake after mistake. And I know mistakes happen in war, but how does a, how does a mistake like the one that happened to World Central Kitchen happen? when World Central Kitchen was working in coordination with the army, letting them know where they were at all times. How do you explain that? And so that's why I think that, you know, but you add that to the president's relationship, that phone call with, with the prime minister yesterday, mm -hmm. and the changes that have been made, the changes have to keep going, because if he does indeed, the Netanyahu, go into Rafa without a plan, for what to do with the million people there, not only will he lose world opinion, I think he'll lose. He will lose the president and lose and lose the United States. Well, if I may bring this back home now, because of course this is resonating in the same way as it is with both of you, with the American public, and we know a lot of people are very closely watching how President Biden handles this moment, especially in some key battleground states. All of this unfolding at a time that, at this moment in time, polls show a very tight race between President Biden and former President Trump. Our latest PBS NewsHour and PR Maris poll indicates a 50 to 48 slight lead President Biden has over former President Trump. That is within the margin of error. But there are a couple of quick takeaways I want to get both of your takes on, if you don't mind. In one question, we asked Americans if they felt that Americans have to resort to violence to get the country back on track. A majority, 79 percent, disagreed or strongly disagreed, but 12 percent of Democrats, 28 percent of Republicans, and 18 percent of independents agreed violence might be necessary. Couple that with another question we asked about whether they wanted to see a president or a leader who's willing to break the rules to set things straight. And some 41 percent of Americans agreed with that. That includes 56 percent of Republicans, 28 percent of Democrats, and 37 percent of independents. Jonathan, what kind of picture does that paint for you? So the violence question, um, well, it should be zero percent who say that violence is, is necessary. But that uh, didn't concern me as much as the break the rules, someone who is willing to break the rules to get the country back on track. That's all, that's the Trump Election, that's the Trump campaign right there, just wants to break the rules to, to get the country back on track. I broke the rules coming to the studio today. People break rules all the time. I, 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 was ask, I went which, over the speed rules? limit. Okay. I went, I, right. I went over to the clarify. speed limit. And so I think when people here break the rules, they're not thinking ransack the Capitol. They're thinking what they might view as little things. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about Donald Trump, breaking the rules is is breaking law and order, breaking social, breaking norms, and you know, breaking democracy. And so that's why when you have 56 percent um, saying that they agree or strongly agree that that's 56 percent of Republicans of, of, of Republicans, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But still a big number of just the nation overall. Yeah. that's that's really concerning because that inures to the benefit of Trump. David, how do you see it? I just want to say I, I followed the speed limit on my way here today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I had the exact same reaction as Jonathan. I, I'm not a big fan of that, uh, would you resort to violence, because I don't know what that means. I, I don't know what violence means in that context. Hmm. Uh, and so it, people, when people answer that question, that they're really saying, how upset are you about the way things are going? But the breaking the rules thing, uh, that is, uh, to me, also much more upsetting, because that really is the seedbed of authoritarianism. And it's mostly on the right. Uh, Trump is scaring a lot of people that we, you know, we have to break the rules. But it's a little on the left. You hear people say we need to bust up the system, we need to tear down the system, and that way lies authoritarianism. And you can see it in the Philippines, you can see it in Hungary, you can see it in Poland. Whenever you have a rise of authoritarianism, it's because people think that breaking the rules is somehow okay to make the streets safe. It's sort of like the dirty Harry defense. Uh, and to me, it's just that—that's the most worrying part of, of, of our survey.
Jonathan, I hate to ask you this in the last 30 seconds or so we have, but what about the impact of the third party no labels effort mm -hmm. ending their attempt to try to field a presidential ticket? What kind, how does that change the landscape? I don't think it changes the landscape, but like, good for no labels, for see, reading the writing on the wall and paying attention to the people who were they were going to, asking them to be on the ticket, and those people doing their own due diligence and going back to no labels and saying no thank you, but then going public and saying, I did my due diligence, I'm not doing this, and I don't think no label should either. Good for them. Jonathan Capehart, David Brooks, always great to see you both. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anna.